Hi everyone, welcome to episode 13 of the Startup Playbook podcast. My name is Rohit Bhargava and each week I interview successful founders, investors and subject matter experts on how they got started, the strategies they used to succeed and their advice to current and future entrepreneurs. In this episode, I interview Peter Huynh. Peter is the co-founder and partner at Qualgro, a US $50 million fund investing in technology startups across Southeast Asia, India, Australia and New Zealand. The fund has been very active since launching a year ago, making 11 investments in its first year in operation. Prior to Qualgro, Peter was a co-founder of Optus Innovate, a corporate VC investing in early-stage Australian technology startups and part of Singtel Group's $250 million corporate VC fund. In this interview, Peter discusses the challenges of doing business in Southeast Asia, the difference between seed stage versus Series A investment, the key metrics investors look for in investment opportunities, why good investors focus on long-term over short-term interests, why referrals and reputations are so important to investors, and a bonus section on why self-awareness is important in growing businesses and making investment decisions. Without further ado, here is my interview with Peter Huynh. Hi, Peter. Welcome to the Startup Playbook podcast. It's great having you on the show. Hey, Rohit. Thanks for having me on the show. So for those people that uh, aren't too familiar with you and your background, can you uh, share a little bit about your experience? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Look, thanks for having me uh, here. I uh, really appreciate you reaching out and happy to share and all all the sort of experiences that I've had in startup land and uh, all the things that I've learnt uh, over the last few years. In terms of my background, I spent the last four years at Singtel Group. Um, and when I was at Singtel Group, I worked in both corporate VC and tech M&A for Singtel Group. Um, you might have heard of uh, Singtel Innovate, which is a uh, $250 million corporate VC fund uh, out of Singtel. Um, and I worked uh, with the Singtel Innovate team. I also worked uh, in a business unit known as Singtel Group Digital Life, um, leading the tech M&A activities for them uh, as well. Uh, before that, I was at Hutchison Group, and I was there for almost six years. I worked both in Australia and in um, in the UK as well for Hutchison, uh, and I held a number of roles for them, um, uh, product development, business development, uh, corporate development, strategy roles uh, there. Um, and it was during the time that I was with Hutchison in London that I got exposed to um, uh, working with some uh, Silicon Valley uh, businesses. And I remember it was sort of late 09, start of 2010, that I got to um, work with uh, Facebook's mobile team in, um, uh, in Palo Alto to roll out Facebook Zero. And I'm not sure if you sort of recall at that time, there wasn't there wasn't lean startup. It wasn't a book. <laughs> there was nothing. But I just working with those folks that they were using all these sort of ter- all, all this terminology. I just didn't know <laughs> what they were talking about. But I knew that we moved quickly, super quickly. Um, and so uh, after that experience, um, you know, I got I, I got led to you know, reading all the blog posts and all this sort of stuff that was coming up around the time, um, and I was hooked on startups from. From, from that point onwards. Um, but prior to Hutchison, um, I was in uh, agency land, uh, working in a number of agencies that were owned by WPP, uh, digital agencies, both in Australia and in Asia as well. Um, but it was when I came back from London in 2011 and joined um, Singtel Group and Optus, uh, looking around the Australian startup scene, trying to figure out you know, what's going on here, where is everybody, um, why is there more startup activity um, in Australia, and I guess that's where my uh, career in Australian uh, VC began. Great. Um, and so, obviously, I mean, you were part of, um, you know, the very early days of the startup community in, in Sydney, especially uh, with Singtel. What um, what have you seen that's kind of evolved in, in the tech startup ecosystem since since you first were there in, in 2011? Yeah, I mean, I remember coming back uh, from the UK and taking a look around, there wasn't much happening in the in, in the startup scene at that time. We had the opportunity to uh, uh, be one of the sponsors for Startup Weekend in Melbourne uh, that year, and it was the very first event at York Butter Factory. I'm not sure if you, <laughs> you remember that. Time. I do remember that. I think we actually <laughs> met at the Startup Weekend as well. Uh, yeah, back in and Sydney. so you know, it was uh, it it was great. I mean, um, the energy. Uh, I wanted other folks within corporate land 
to see and feel the energy of um, uh, uh, of startups. And I think one of the um, best ways to do that is to take them on a uh, weekend hackathon or to, to, to a start weekend event. It's not the it's not the same, of course. We we know that, but it's a great way for folks to dip their toe uh, in the water uh, and see how much can be done uh, within uh, a short time period. And I think that as we evolve the ecosystem, it's important to remember about these types of events because I know that uh, as people spend more time in the ecosystem, um, we kind of forget, and I'm guilty of this as well. We kind of forget of the impact that an event like a startup weekend can have on people. Uh, and I, I was at a, uh, a talk by Brad Feld, um, I think a week or two ago now in Sydney, where he uh, spoke about how somebody came up to him many years after a startup weekend event and said, you know, thanks, Brad, you kind of changed my life. Uh, I think on my end, I kind of forget that this is often the way that people sort of, this is the gateway drug, if you will. This is often the way that people sort of find their way into the startup community. And for folks who have been a part of the um, ecosystem for a little while, you can kind of uh, almost sort of forget the importance that it has or the impact that it could have. And so I think over the next uh, couple of years, I'm going to try to spend more time uh, at weekend hackathons, whether it's a corporate hackathon or a, a startup weekend, uh, just to see if I can contribute a little bit more to the space and uh, remember the impact that it had, um, not just on me, but on other folks that I had sort of introduced into startup land via, you know, via these sort of uh, hackathon events. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I mean, for me personally, um, you know, hackathons really changed my life and, and my sort of involvement in startups. And my last startup actually came from from a startup weekend as well down in Melbourne. Um, so uh, just briefly, you kind of touched on, uh, you know, hackathons being a great way for corporates to get an understanding of what the energy around startups is like and, and what, you know, working at a, at a startup can be can be like. Um Coming from from the corporate space, what are some of the challenges that you've seen internally, um, as from someone who was clearly passionate about the space, to try and get corporates more involved um, into into the startup ecosystem? Yeah, I mean, a couple of things. I think as corporates start to get more involved in the space, it's important to understand why um, why they're doing it, what the objectives are, um, and. That helps to set and align ex expectations uh, correctly. So, for example, if you're expecting to find the next um, you know, Atlassian, it's very hard <laughs> for that to happen with one internal corporate hackathon on a weekend. It's just not going to happen. Mm. Um, but if the intention is to bring some startup culture and some startup thinking and to help change um, – and challenge some of the prevailing thinking within the organization, those types of events and activities can be really helpful, uh, right? Because it, it, it sort of opens people's eyes as to what is possible and what can be done with very few resources um, uh, but with very, and with very little time but with great focus. Um, on the other end, if the corporate is looking to um, have a relationship with startups uh, that um, – can help with the, some parts of the core business straight away, the strategy may very well be to um, have a fund and invest at later stages because these startups uh, typically, let's say at Series B, are much more ready uh, to work with corporates. And on the corporate side, uh, for example, from corporate procurement, they're probably much more ready to buy services from these startups as well. And there might be uh, more likelihood of potential synergies at least in the uh, in, in the medium term right um, and so uh, it comes back to what it, what is it that you're looking for in terms of engagement with the startup community um, be clear on those objectives and then develop the right strategies and tactics to help deliver on those uh, particular objectives and some of those objectives might be very much um, positioning oriented right um, if your positioning is around wanting to support Australian innovation, then you know, investing earlier is is positive. You're, you're taking more of a risk. The check might be a little bit smaller, but you know, you're you're there uh, and helping when the business really needs it. It's got a lot less um, resources uh, to go on and a lot less of a track record to go on. So you know, all, all of these aspects are uh, important to consider. Um, 
And just coming back to your other question as well, in terms of how the ecosystem has evolved, uh, from certainly from a corporate um, engagement perspective, it's evolved tremendously. I remember when we started um, at Optus here in Australia, forming Optus Innovate and set, setting up the uh, for, for the first few rounds of investment and engagement with the startup community, there were very few other players. I mean, I think at the time, uh, uh, there, there really was, uh, there, there was no reinventure yet, there was no Muru D yet, there was no uh, NAB Ventures, and all of these things have happened since then, and it's fantastic. In fact, we need more. If we compare uh, ourselves to the sort of level of corporate venture that you see over in the States, um, we're well behind. And I, I would certainly encourage any corporates who are interested in finding out more about the space, um, please feel free to reach out to me because I'm very happy to share all the learnings and experiences that, that we had during that time. And I would really encourage um, corporates to, to get involved in the space. I'm convinced that within the next few years, every single one of that ASX 200 will have some type of uh, program or activity in the tech startup space, whether it be in the form of a corporate venture fund uh, or uh, whether it's some type of um, accelerator or incubator or uh, even if it's just sponsoring uh, events uh, or supporting you know, great co-working spaces like, um, like fish burners, for example. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think like one of the, uh, again, just uh, one of the conversations that I've had with or some of the conversations that I've had with people in the ecosystem has been that there's been a hesitancy from corporates because they, they haven't been as sure about what, uh, where they can play a part in in the ecosystem, um, and obviously now, as, as you mentioned, there are a couple of uh, couple of companies that are that are doing really well um, in the space and making a really big impact. Um, do you think that there's a particular a particular company or a particular model that's that's kind of standing out to you in in terms of bringing in that corporate side and, and making a really big impact into the startup ecosystem? Yeah, I, I do. I really like what um, the team at Murudi have done over the last few years I think you know going to their events and meeting with the, the teams there it's obviously a, um, a a project of passion for those folks um, and from a uh, from a corporate VC perspective uh, I, I really like what the team at reinventure uh, have done uh, we uh, co-invested with them uh, on an investment that was announced um, uh, very recently in a business called open agent um, an open agent to help home owners uh, to uh, select the most appropriate or, or, or the right agents to sell their property. Um, and uh, working with that team uh, in, in looking at the business, uh, you know, they, they've just got really high professionalism uh, and, and, and really a pleasure to deal with. So I, I think, you know, uh, these, uh, these folks, uh, I think, are making a big impact on the ecosystem, uh, one from a venture perspective, the other from uh, much more an accelerator perspective. And others are joining. You know, I'm seeing you know, Qantas doing a uh, uh, an internal hackathon. I know NAB Ventures have just started. And I think they've started to make some investments, and it's looking quite promising uh, for that program. And and they have uh, an exceptional internal um, innovation program as well uh, through NAB Labs. So yeah, I think we're. I I do think that we're in the early stages. Uh, I, I'm very happy to have been there relatively early as well. Um, and uh, I look to see it continuing because we need uh, everybody uh, playing their part to create this this rising tide for, um, you know, for, for for tech startups and this industry that we're starting to create here in Australia. Absolutely. And and one of the things that you mentioned earlier again was that um, you know although the you know things are changing uh, quite quickly within Australia, we're still some way behind the US, particularly. Um, obviously, you spend a lot of time looking at and playing in the Southeast Asian market. Um, yourself with with Qualgrow, uh, how does how does Australia compare to what you're seeing um, in Asia at the moment? Yeah, I mean there are. Uh, I think the first point to 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 note is that um, uh, Southeast Asia and Asia are, are many uh, heterogeneous markets um, with all with their own nuances, all with their own uh, specific. Uh, ways of doing things and all with their own very specific cultures and characteristics. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's different uh, across each. 
Um, so our fund, um, uh, Qualgro, is based in Singapore. It's a uh, 50 million US dollar uh, fund. Uh, we um, uh, closed or we closed the fund uh, in August of last year. So we've been around for one year now. And we've made 11 investments so far uh, across uh, Southeast Asia and also Australia. We've made two investments out of that 11 in Australia. Uh, the other nine uh, across Southeast Asia, and we've invested now in um, startups in Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, India, and Myanmar. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think our pace of investment has been pretty good. 11 deals in 12 months is, uh, <laughs> is, is pretty fast. It's quite active. Uh, yeah, we're quite active. We're definitely not tire kickers, that's uh, I can guarantee. Um, so, you know, uh, in terms of the different um, uh, nuances of the different markets, I think when I speak about Singapore, certainly it's a, it's a, it's a developed market. It's got phenomenal government support. Uh, it's got the best government support that um, I can see pretty much anywhere um, in terms of the level of um, uh, proactiveness, the level of encouragement, um, uh, and the level of incentive, to be quite frank, um, coming from the uh, Singaporean government to encourage Singapore as a uh, startup hub for the region. And they're doing a great job. Um, one of the key uh, examples of this is when we're investing, in, even though we've invested in Indonesia and uh, India, for example, those startups that we've invested in have actually incorporated in Singapore. So whilst the, some aspects of the business or a majority of the business is conducted um, in India or in Indonesia, we're investing in the Singaporean entity, which makes it a lot easier for us uh, from a number of different perspectives, compliance being one of them. Um, so Singapore, great government support. Uh, there's a lot of corporate support in Singapore now as well. Uh, we've got the banks with their accelerator programs. We have other accelerator programs in Singapore at the moment, uh, Entrepreneur First, which will have their first intake this year, uh, which is a UK-based program. Uh, Startup Bootcamp have their fintech program in Singapore as well. There are lots of accelerator programs, including Muru D. So Muru D outside of um, Sydney have um, their own program in only one other city, and that is in Singapore. They've got partner programs in uh, Brisbane, of course, and other parts of uh, Australia uh, and in other countries as well. But uh, in terms of their own program, it's only in two cities. One happens to be in Sydney and one is in Singapore. Uh, I mean, another uh, ecosystem worth mentioning is uh, Indonesia. Indonesia is a uh, huge, huge opportunity, huge market in terms of uh, social media usage, uh, one of the most active in the world. We've made one investment there in a B2B marketplace called Rolali. Um, I think when we talk about Indonesia, I think the standout businesses there are very much from a B2C perspective. Um, and we're looking at a very sort of exciting space right now that as a firm, we feel we'll probably start to consolidate relatively soon. Um, and so you know, for us as well, we, we, we like to focus on what we do best. And given our backgrounds, B2B, um, enterprise, SMB is much more the sort of space that we would like to play. Um, and perhaps another market to call out as well is Vietnam, where there is incredible opportunity. Um, the level of computer engineering and computer science education in Vietnam even at high school level, is quite advanced, um, some of the most advanced in the world in terms of uh, computer science curriculum. Uh, and there are some fantastic engineers, many fantastic engineers coming out of Vietnam um, with a population of 90 million, rapidly approaching 100 million. Um, there are some significant market opportunities there, and we're only in the sort of early stages of, it, stages of exploring uh, some potential investments there, but uh, I think it's likely that we'll be spending much more time there over the next few years. Sure. Um, obviously, you know, playing in a in a really large geographical area with such different, um, you know, cultural, uh, such different cultures and, and such different sort of advantages and, and opportunities in different regions, 
what is it that that you look for in an investment opportunity? Are you looking for uh, a company that can sort of uh, quickly break out and expand across Southeast Asia, or, or are you looking for someone that can really dominate their their local market and and really take advantage of the opportunity that they face in their own uh, culture or in, or in their own country? Yeah, it depends on the life cycle stage of the business that we're looking at, but. If we're looking uh, at making an, an A round investment, which is which is really where our sweet spot is, we would need to believe that the business could become a regional business. Um, that that is um, the potential that we're seeking at the very least, if not global in nature. Um, and so, uh, it may not be um, a regional business as yet. It may not have uh, proven that out, but we need to believe that that is possible uh, with the team uh, that is there. Uh, what we'd like to see, of course, and depending on, and it's different models for different types of businesses. Uh, if it's a business that requires uh, really strong sort of early network effects at play, you might prefer to have a higher concentration of users in a smaller geographic footprint and have higher density as a result. Um, and for those types of businesses, of course, we would want that business to win out their local um, country before expanding. Uh, or at least sort of setting a beachhead for expansion at the same time but not committing to uh, further geographic expansion until they really prove out product market fit uh, in their own space. But again, there are other types of businesses as well. Um, If it's more sort of B2C SaaS, it may not require uh, that type of um, scale-up. So it really depends on the business model um, that's at play. But typically, if we're looking at a business, it must we must believe that it can be uh, one of the regional or the regional winner in the space that in, in which it's competing. Sure. Um, so obviously with, with Quagro, as, as you mentioned, you kind of your sweet spot is more the Series A. Um, with with Singtel and Optus Innovate, you were sort of, I guess, more looking at the earlier stage t- uh, startups at, um, you know, through, I think it was the Innovate program. Yep. Um, what, what are some of the differences, if any, that... Um, that you that you now look for um, in the later stage startups that uh, that you weren't sort of looking for in in earlier stage startups. Yeah, absolutely. Um, for us, if I'm looking at a seed stage business, it's much more that I'm looking at directionally you know, whether the team is going to be able to execute in the space that they're in. Directionally, whether traction will um, continue at pace. So it's more. You know, directionality in terms of you know, how these businesses or can these businesses, can we believe that these businesses are going to be able to scale? And one of the most important things when I look at a, um, a, a, at a seed stage business and I typically look at late seed rather than early seed is can they, can they deliver big percentages with small numbers? Because if they can't, it's going to be very difficult with um, larger volume, right? I think intuitively you know that that makes sense. Um, and I'm looking very much at engagement, right? Um, we don't have scale yet, but for the folks that are using it, are they advocates? Um, are they um, highly engaged with the product or service? Are they using it you know, you know, daily, weekly, monthly? You know, what, what is that level of engagement? Is it a toothbrush for them rather than a vitamin? So you know, <laughs> these are the things that we uh, look at at seed stage. The, the, the vectors of the business or the areas of the business that we look at um, it's 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 still roughly the same, right? We still we look at team, we look at market space, which includes you know the competitive dynamics of the space. We look at the product and where the product is at. Um, we look at traction. We look at the underlying tech, of course. We look at you know, financials of the business, how they're going to deploy the capital, uh, in 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 what places and why, and for what purpose. And of course, we look we look at the the terms of the investment. So we look at all these things. But the difference between um, a Series A, for example, uh, versus um, a late seed is that we're looking for proven execution in those areas, right? Um, so when we're looking at traction, we want to, you know, we want to see um, uh, what's the, you know, what's the CAC, um, what's the ratio between CAC and uh, LTV, what is, uh, what are the best channels, you know, what what channels have you been experimenting with? And uh, what's worked and what's not worked and, and, and why, right? We, we, we expect to see a lot more in terms of um, proof points uh, in these areas when we're looking at a business raising their A round. 
And when I'm talking about um, all of these different facets, they're all important. Um, but the most important for us um, is very much around the team. In fact, all the questions that we ask, whether it's in relation to tech or financials or um, those sorts of things, it really comes back to what does it tell us about the team? So when I talk about team, a lot of people sort of think it's like an HR type um, uh, dynamic that I'm talking about. Um, and there is that aspect of it too, but really I'm, I'm wanting to know you know, how good is this team from an executional perspective? Have they got their act together in terms of organizing um, the business and organizing the team? Um, how quickly can they build, test, learn? How quickly can they iterate? What metrics are they looking at in deciding what goes into the next build? How frequent are the builds, right? Um, all, of these, all of these aspects tell us a lot about the, the team and their ability to, um, to execute. Um, even when I'm looking at the tech and we go through a, a tech discussion, a lot of it is about what is what is the decision making process of the team. Why have the team um, implemented the solution in this particular way? Is it for speed? Is there some technical debt? Are they aware of the technical debt? Do they have it in play at some point in time um, to um, to address you know those issues? Uh, so. At, at late seed stage, at seed stage, it's harder to have answers for some of these aspects. But certainly when you're raising an A round, I want to get a sense of how's the team sort of thinking through these things. Um, financials um, is another area as well. The financials, yes, we take a look at the financial model, not to really critique it as to whether we think it's right or wrong. We look at the financial model because we want to understand how the team is um, thinking about the business. How do they think about unit economics at critical mass, um, how does the team um, think about the need to scale uh, in terms of you know, sales and marketing costs uh, over the next phase of the business versus the focus on product that, that has been there to date? How does that change over time? Where is it going to be committed? What is the phasing of the spend? Is it all up front and very little behind or is it does it all ramp up towards the end? Uh, all these things tell us about uh, how operationally um, strong or executionally strong the team is, um, and we look at all of these aspects in great detail during our during our process. Sure. So, so speaking of team, obviously at, at Series A, um, you know, people are are more at the the growth stage, and they've got more of a budget for marketing and and things like that. How do you uh, do you expect them to have a full team behind them? Or, or do you see um, your role as kind of helping facilitate where some of the gaps are once they once they start working with you in, in their team? Yeah. yeah, it's a little bit of both. It, it, it depends on the type of team, of course. Some teams will be very engineering strong and engineering led. Uh, other teams are more um, um, hustler led, if you will, by that time. And um, by the time folks are raising their Series A, they understand where um, they have gaps and they understand and typically have some type of um, uh, hiring approach and hiring budget and some capital that they would like to set aside, uh, whether it's the form of straight capital or parts of the option pool, to bring in that talent that is missing. So we want to understand how well does this team know itself, how well does the team understand gaps, and can they um, identify or have they been able to identify at least the types of talent that they need to bring in uh, to be successful at this next phase. And you've got to remember, at every at the end of every raise, um, the, the business is different in a way. And the capabilities that took the team to that point may not be and is, are, are unlikely to be the exact same capabilities that will make them successful for the next phase of the business. So, for example, um, at seed, whether it's early seed or late seed, it's very much a product focus, um, and we would expect that to be the case. As the team transitions into an A round, it starts to become much more of a sales and marketing focus, albeit with quite a lot of product development still to come as well. And then as we get into the B round, um, we expect, for example, for the team to have um, a very strong sales engine in place, right? And whether it's a top-down sale or, or bottom-up sale, we expect the team to be really cranky in terms of efficiency of, uh, of sales. Um, and and the, the, the switch in terms of the mindset of the, uh, of the business is, you know, whilst there is some product development, of course, still ongoing, um, the, the business is very much on a ge geographic uh, expansion growth path. 
Um, these are generalizations, of course, but it gives you sort of the, 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 a, a sense of you know, round to round. And the really good teams are the ones that, on the back of the raise, take time out to reset their business um, and get their house in order to become successful and lay the, the, the foundations for success at this next round. So imagine you've closed your A round, um, you've got you've raised five million or so, whatever it may be, um, and you you will have to hire uh, more quickly than you've done. So are your HR processes in place to deal with that? Um, whether it's being able to hire you know a lot more engineers a lot more quickly, uh, or bringing in a new type of hire that has never been in the business before, right? Um, and so the best teams and the best founders seem to. Um, you know, once they've uh, locked in their next round of funding, they know that they're going very well. They start those processes to make sure that they lay the foundations within the business itself um, to be able to support this next phase of growth. Sure. Um, speaking of, of foundations, I, I recently um, heard a story about a startup that went to the US with a decent amount of traction, but they had um, they didn't have their internal structures right. Uh, when it came to the legal side of things, um, I, I don't know the details or the specifics of that. But um, again, as a as a Series A investor, um, are there certain certain things that um, that put you off in, in terms of structures internally uh, from yeah. investing in a startup? Yeah, I mean, I think for us, we like it. We like things to be straightforward, clear, and simple from a structural perspective. Um, uh, we. What's important for us uh, outside of the structure as well is we want to make sure that the founding team is sufficiently incentivized. And the problem is that um, if the founding team have raised too much too early uh, and diluted too early, that can carry on for you know, the next few, few rounds of the business and it may need to be corrected. In fact, it will need to be corrected. Um, and these are issues that we, we, we think about deeply because uh, it's very important for us that the interests are aligned. Um, we have one example uh, for one of the businesses that we invested in. Um, we, when we were, when we were, we're looking at the round, uh, and the term sheet came from the founders, it had for a one um, X uh, participating liquidation preference. Um, and as we looked at the business and thought about it, and we were leading this particular round, we thought actually, you know what? I think it's much better for the long term, uh, in the long term interests of the business for it to be non-participating on our end. And uh, even though that might not necessarily be uh, in the short-term business of our fund, uh, it's in you know, sort of much better long-term um, interests of the business, which in turn will be beneficial to our fund. And so that's what we suggested, and we changed the terms um, as a result um, because we very strongly feel that um, having uh, an appropriate level of um, uh, aligned interests uh, and if you will, skin in the game for the founders is vitally important. Uh, we don't want the type of business where the founders are coming in to sort of, you know, cash in their um, paycheck and punch the ticket for the day. Um, as you know, with tech startups, it's very much around you know, hyper growth um, and hyper momentum. And the only way that you can sustain that is if you're um, sufficiently motivated, both from a um, vision perspective in terms of what you want to do, but also making sure that the work that you go into it, the sweat that you go into it, uh, is commensurately rewarded with the right type of equity. Sure. And and for startups that are that are then kind of progressing from their their seed round of funding to looking at Series A, what's the approach that that they should take to get Series A investment? Well, um, <laughs> I think uh, I mean a couple of things come to mind. One one is that reach out to investors. Um, well in advance, right, uh, and form that relationship. So uh, you might not be raising for another three to six months, but it would be good to reach out to some investors in your space, do the research, reach out to the appropriate ones, get an introduction to the appropriate ones who are investing in your space and um, form a relationship with them, you know, ask for their thoughts and feedback, um, uh, make sure you're on um, their radar. Uh, when it comes to preparing the um, investor deck, um, obviously the level of detail uh, and information that's required is another step up. You should have more metrics to go on than from seed stage. Uh, be clear with the investor deck. You know, I think you know cover the areas that I spoke about before, um, and uh, I think that um, 
if if the team has come from say a um, an accelerator uh, prior, uh, typically I see the investor deck at Series A as being quite um, sparse. And I think a lot of that has to do with sort of demo day style pitching um, at the earlier round. But the A round um, investor deck is different. The A round investor deck is not going to be a deck that you present in front of. 20 to 200 people it's going to be a deck that is provided to investors and so you know, it needs to be punchy but it needs to have the right level of granularity so that folks know um, your growth trajectory um, revenue uh, how revenue is tipped to grow uh, where are you going to uh, commit use of funds um, uh, uh, into what areas and why you know uh, all, all of these things need to be explained in much more detail and then of course that what goes along with um, that investor deck is a one pager and you use the one pager to qualify the various investors uh, and the one pager is really uh, a much short, shorter summary uh, of some of the key points of information in relation to the, the business um, and this one pager is what investors VCs typically send to each other so I might get a one pager and it says uh, you know this particular business is in um, uh, let's say uh, e-commerce which we don't invest in uh, at a late seed stage but I may know some investors uh, that could be interested I'll ask the founder to see if they're interested for me to flick it on and then I will and I'll only send the one pager and then uh, along with an intro email and see if they're interested in connecting um, so the one pager is important it's a marketing tool uh, that can be very useful uh, to make uh, introductions uh, much more simply between VCs and then to introduce them to the particular team in question. Sure. So speaking of getting getting warm introductions as well, we were talking briefly before we turned on this uh, this interview about how you don't have a website yet. Um, <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> And uh, but you know, despite despite not having a website or um, as you were kind of mentioning any sort of uh, direct presence uh, online. Uh, you still get sort of high quality deal flow coming in from your referrals and and from your from your network. Um, can you share a little bit about why referrals and warm introductions are, are really important to investors? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in in terms of this industry, the currency um, is relationships, uh, and we're very careful with uh, our relationships. We spend a lot of time with other VC firms, with other entrepreneurs. Uh, we spend a lot of time in the ecosystem and we're very respectful of everybody's time as well. I mean, if we're spending time with founders who are raising, for example, uh, if it's uh, if it's a no from us, we'll let them know early. Um, uh, if we're going through a process with them, we will try to be as efficient with their time as possible. Um, and all of these things are important because um, uh, for us, for example, as I, as I mentioned to you before, yes, we, we don't have a website. Um, our deals come from uh, referral from other funds. We touch base with a whole range of other funds in, across the entire region uh, on a regular basis. Um, and it only works if you're a um, positive player uh, in the ecosystem, um, right? Um, and, and that's when people will want to spend time with you and work with you and feel that you're a good person, for example, or a good fund to fill out um, the round, um, for example. So, um, you know, for us, it, it's all about making sure that we um, behave in a in a positive way. We link people through where it's relevant. We don't waste people's time, and we make sure that we you know, we always have uh, our ethics and um, the benefit of the ecosystem uh, at mind in the way that we sort of interact with the community. So, one example of this is in relation to NDAs. We don't sign NDAs. I think it's a sort of common commonly understood. Um, mechanic within the industry that when it comes to investor decks, we don't sign NDAs. Of course, if we're going into a data room for a B round business, um, highly proprietary information, uh, highly confidential information, of course, we will be signing NDAs then. Uh, but that's very different from uh, an investor deck. Um, uh, and given that we don't sign NDAs, uh, for the most part, we are very careful on a couple of things. One, one, we're very careful on checking conflicts. So if someone reaches out to us and says, hey, look, we'd like to reach out to you, here's our one pager, um, we're very mindful of making sure that there's nothing in our portfolio, whether current or whether we've got a term sheet out, that could be a potential conflict um, with, that, uh, with that particular business. The other thing is that, of course, once they send the information to us, we make sure that we um, store it and keep it and manage it in a secure way. 
Um, and and this is you know this is very important to us. You know, there's no disclosure on our side to any other parties. Uh, it's for us to uh, review uh, the potential investment um, only. And so these are the sort of things where I say, you know, you need to be careful with these things because um, if you're not, um, it'll affect reputation. And really, uh, reputation is uh, is so important in the industry that we're in. Uh, as I said, the currency is all about the currency of relationships and connections. And we want to make sure that we're a positive connection for all the folks that we're involved with. Absolutely. Um, I'm really mindful of your time. Um, just quickly before we, we wrap up. Um, for startups uh, specifically based in in Australia who are looking to to expand into the Asian market, um, do you have any suggestions on on how they can um, how they should go about approaching that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Asia is a relationship driven um, uh, business economy. So if you're going to expand into Asia, irrespective of what what market it is. Um, spend some time there. I, I can't say, uh, I can't stress that enough. You've got to spend time there and form relationships there, no matter what it is that you're <laughs> building or, or looking to scale. And you'll find out so much more on the ground um, than you will just trying to do some desk research. By all means, do some desk research first, uh, but make sure you have feet on the ground. Um, there's a new service called um, Loop Space. Uh, and it, I think it's like a passport to be able to go work in a bunch of different co-working spaces across Asia. Um, and so, you know, you kind of sort of subscribe to it, uh, and then you can sort of spend a couple of days in different co-working spaces, whether it's in you know, Shanghai or Hong Kong or Singapore. So that's a good way of, uh, uh, of doing it. Or head over and just get a hot desk at one particular um, uh, co-working space. Uh, I guess before you head over, the other thing to do is maybe uh, uh, check if there are any events that are on. So the big events in Asia during the year are uh, Tech in Asia, which is on in Singapore in April. Um, InnovFest, which is run by the National University of uh, Singapore, which is on in May. Um, We've got Rise, which is in Hong Kong, run by the Web Summit folks. Uh, that's at the end of May. And then in June, we've got Echelon, also in Singapore. So they are the sort of key events. They all happen to be at roughly <laughs> the same time uh, of the year. And then there's you know not much else outside of that. But um, they're the big events. And um, the reason why it's good to go during those events um, is not only for the content, but really that's where that's when people congregate. So you know if you go to um, Rise, for example, you meet folks from um, Korea or China or Philippines or you know, all all across Asia. And, and equally, if you go to Echelon, um, uh, you know you'll, you'll meet folks from around all around Southeast Asia as well. So it's a it's a good place to connect with a lot of folks over a couple of days, um, uh, and then sort of that forms your um, uh, you know, your initial connections in, into then visiting some of those other countries. Perfect. I'll make sure that I, I link up Loop Space and some of the other conferences conferences that you mentioned uh, in the show notes that'll be available on startupplaybook.co. Um, awesome. Finally, uh, Peter, if for people that uh, that want to sort of follow you, get in touch, um, things like that, what's what's the best way for them to to do that? Yeah, um, just uh, uh, I'm on uh, Twitter, so it's uh, Peter J Huyn H U Y N H. Um, that's probably the best way to. I'm I'm relatively uh, 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 frequently updating on Twitter. The other is through LinkedIn, um, and LinkedIn again, it's Peter Peter J Quinn. Um, but yeah, Twitter is probably the, the the best method to do so. We probably will have a website. <laughs> <laughs> we'll probably put one up in the next I don't know month or so. I think it's about time. We're one year old now. Uh, we've made eleven investments now, so there's plenty of portfolio companies to put up there. Um, and it's probably a good way uh, for us to, um, you know, uh, for us to, to make sure that when folks are sending us something that it's relevant and <laughs> we've got no one else to blame but ourselves. And I, I, I think the URL is going to be qualgrow.com. So Q-U-A-L-G-R-O.com. Um, it's not up yet. <laughs> so if you get there, um, there won't be anything there quite yet, but I think we'll put one up in the next month or so. Watch this space. So. Yeah, Absolutely. Excellent. Thanks a lot for your, your insights, Peter. That's, uh, that's been tremendously, uh, tremendously in- insightful for people uh, wanting to find out more about the, the Asian market and just corporates and startups in general. So thank you.
Awesome. Thanks, Rohit. Great to speak to you. Awesome. Have a great day. Uh, and um, you know, if all the folks out there in startup land, um, keep on going, keep on learning, um, and uh, keep on sharing what you learn because this is a real pay-it-forward um, ecosystem, and I'd love for you to keep on doing that. After this interview was recorded, Peter reached out about including a bonus section on something he is extremely passionate about, self-awareness, and why it is an important factor in growing successful startups and in making investment decisions. Sorry for the audio quality of this bonus section recording, but hope you find this additional content useful. So Peter, I know one of the big things that um, that's really important to you is self-awareness, especially when it comes to founding teams and uh, the investments that, that you look for. Can you kind of elaborate a little bit on that point? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I started uh, meditating about 10 years ago um, and uh, I've had time to arrive, uh, taught classes um, in terms of meditation and I found it so um, useful for me both as um, an investor but also when I look at um, high-performing teams, they've got so many traits of, around self-awareness. I mean, when I think about the high-performing teams that I've been around, they, at the core of it, they have this sort of brutal honesty that they're able to um, uh, to draw upon in um, making sense of their experience, right? I mean, the, the, the high-performing teams that I've been around are highly intellectually curious, what's working, what's not working, let's try this or whatever it may be, and not taking um, the playbook or status quo as it is. Um, there is this level of almost egolessness about it, which is around letting the, um, uh, the data speak for itself, um, having the customer, having the product uh, at the center of it, rather than um, egos around the room and being totally transparent with how they work together um, and uh, if things aren't working, calling it out um, early and often. And so uh, I don't think that there is um, any surprise that this correlates well with that journey of self-awareness where um, you know, it helps to cultivate some of these um, key traits. And then from an investor's perspective, when I'm uh, assessing a potential investment or, or, or talking to a, a team, you know, I need to be aware of my own um, um, biases or prejudices against uh, whether it's um, you know, previous experiences uh, with this type of business or whatever it may be, I need to be fully aware of that. Um, and that's really helped to make sure that I come in with an open mind and a clean slate um, around you know, assessing um, what I'm hearing and seeing from the team. Um, then, of course, um, judging that according to you know, whether it's you know, pattern recognition or whatever else it may be, but with uh, a real and true and clear view as the, to the data rather than emotion um, that's gathered around it. So uh, I just think that uh, when it comes to um, working with high-performing teams, seeing that self-awareness, I believe that cultivating that self-awareness in whatever way that you want to as a founder is absolutely critical. Uh, and I think that's um, uh, mandatory in terms of you know, making sure that you can move as quickly as you can without that sort of baggage that comes around you know, managing teams and egos and all those sorts of things. You have to do that, but it's so much easier and uh, for you as a founder if you have that high level of self-awareness. Sure. So uh, obviously that's, that's self-awareness from an individual perspective in terms of the decisions that you're making. Is there Have you seen any startups or can you see a way that um, the teams or, or the internal culture can be made to be more self-aware? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, you know, having a, a constant um, review of how things are working and calling things out uh, I see this trait in a lot of startups. It seems to be almost inherent within startup culture that you know, things are based on merit. There is a sense of um, equality. Uh, it's not about people's titles. You know, all these sorts of things, having a flat hierarchy, having a flat structure, um, being about delivering value um, uh, rather than you know, just previous experience, all those sorts of things. Um, I, I'm really positive about the, um, the startup culture itself. And so, you know, I, I think um, other examples are, you know, having your regular town hall and those sorts of things. Um, when you look at big business, they don't really do those sort of things, <laughs> right? And so um, it may be because they're too large. It may be because um, that type of openness and transparency just isn't possible uh, in uh, larger organizations. Um, but certainly uh, having that, that constant feedback loop, that constant communication loop, and having 
real honesty and curiosity at the core of it, I, I think is um, is what will really help startups. And for the most part, I see it as such a, it's so intrinsic to the culture already um, that uh, it, it may be the the uh, the correlating factor that um, uh, explains why startups are so successful and how how they're able to move so quickly. Well, one of the um, one of the patterns that I've seen between some of the investors that I've spoken to privately, and and obviously yourself, Paul, and, and Shelley that I've had on the show, is um, the need to balance the, um, I guess the the vision that that startups have with with taking on feedback. Do you think that um, having or being more self aware makes you more coachable as a person? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and some of it plays into ego, I, I suppose. You know, and having um, if you will, uh, an openness uh, and an empty cup um, so that you can take in the feedback. Um, I think it's important for uh, founders and founding teams to be able to take in feedback and to be coachable. Um, And for a couple of reasons. One is um, you you just don't know what you don't know. You have to uh, have a sense of um, taking in um, feedback from different perspectives and being able to synthesize those and make sure that it fits into to what you're doing and not just applying it um, point, point blank. And you have to d- continually develop as a founding group the skills and the perspectives that may have made that team successful for um, seed stage may not be the same sets of skills that will make that team successful at the A round, B round or C round. Uh, in fact, um, as, this, as the focus switches from product um, more towards sales, more towards service, more towards other elements of the business. You do have to, you do have to change. You do have to evolve, and being coachable helps you to evolve quickly. Um, and if the business is scaling really quickly, you, know, you, you might have had a year in normal time um, to have built those skills, but in startup time, that could be a month. Right. <laughs> so you have to be able to to take in feedback. You have to be able to be coachable in order to be able to move that quickly. Do you have any tips? Uh, or kind of routines or exercises that you have to, to make yourself more self-aware? Yeah, absolutely. So um, for me, it's about breathing, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, if, you're, um, if you're centered, if you're breathing, if you're feeling um, more comfortable within your own skin, this helps so much. So you know, um, for, for, for folks day to day, the simple act of just sitting down, taking a deep breath, taking stock of where you're at, just even taking stock of how you're feeling and acknowledging it. You know, hey, I'm really tired right now and so I could be, um, you know, uh, either seeing things differently or maybe more quickly to, 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 for something to trigger me or for, for me to, to be angry about something. You know, all those things are very helpful in day-to-day in terms of managing um, your business and your team. Um, I also run, so, you know, running has been helpful for me. It's almost like a meditative practice, but... I think the biggest thing for me is um, uh, that breathing aspect of it. Take a deep breath, take a few deep breaths, um, slow down, right, and um, just acknowledge where you're at, and then you might see things in a in a calmer light. Absolutely, and I think it's really important, especially in an environment where uh, I guess startups or, or founders specifically don't really talk about things when when things get hard or when things get difficult. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think yeah. kind of. Maintaining that that center of balance and, and that self awareness is is really important to sort of keep you going through the hard times. Yeah, look, it's a it's a lonely exercise sometimes. I mean, particularly for the CEO, you know, of a of a startup. You know, hopefully, there's a there's a founding group, but the CEO role can be um, quite lonely. And so, uh, being able to reflect on some of that, um, I think, can can really um, can really help. And you've got you've just got to evolve so quickly. So. Um, you know, one of the other exercises uh, that I recommend to do is just you know, as you sit down and contemplate things, write them down. Right. Sometimes the act of um, acknowledging where you're at and just simply writing it down um, helps you to uh, recognize it and then move on from it and process it. Thanks for listening to episode 13 of the Startup Playbook podcast and hope you enjoyed the sub- bonus section on self-awareness. You can find the show notes of my interview with Peter along with a curated list of tools and resources for startup founders at startupplaybook.co. As always, you can join the conversation through our Twitter account. The handle is at Playbook Startup. Next week, I interview Ben Chan. Ben is the executive GM of Envato. 
Envato is the world's leading marketplace and community for creative assets and creative people, owning marketplaces such as Theme Forest, Audio Jungle, and Video Hive. To date, they have paid out over $400 million to users of their platform. In this episode, Ben shares what startups can learn from corporates, how startups can change during different stages of growth, hiring and leadership in fast-growing teams, the importance of having mentors, and how to launch a successful marketplace. Don't forget to subscribe to stay up to date with our latest episodes. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you at episode 14 next week.